Wing Feather Saga by Andrew Peterson. Book Two North or Be Eaten. Chapter 18 Old Wounds and New Healing. He couldn't move his arms or legs. The troll tromped southward, dragging Pete by a length of rope like an ox with a plow. Pete, wrapped tight from head to toe in chains, was jarred and battered by every root, stone, and pothole in the road. He drifted in and out of consciousness, and every time he woke, he saw Zozab and the other ridge runner perched on the troll's shoulders, watching him with wicked pleasure. He remembered the Gargan rock roach's terrible clacking the day before. Just as Zozab had ordered the troll to retreat from the gully, he caught a glimpse of the Igbies and Oscar fleeing north. Though he had screeched and thrashed, the troll held him fast, so tight that his vision blurred and everything went black. When he awoke, it was night, and he was wrapped in chains like a moth in a spider web. You'll be glad to know that your precious jewels have escaped once more, Zozab had said. He sat cross-legged by a fire and shoveled a handful of sugar berries into his mouth, then passed the basket to the other ridge runner. The red stains around their mouths looked like blood. Pete had stared at the ridge runners without speaking, partly because the chain wrapped around his face made it hard to breathe, and partly because he couldn't figure out whom the ridge runner was talking about. His mind was a muddled mess. Jewels? I love the jewels, but what? I remember the children who escaped. Uh, the children, yes, good. But what were their names again? I can't remember their names. Hungry and thirsty, arms hurt. I shouldn't have left him. I didn't mean to. I didn't want to, but I left him. Ah, oh, Maker, what have I done? Pete's mind filled with shadows and feathers and a wail that echoed through dank corridors. He was dimly aware of the Ridge Runners watching him from the fire as he thrashed and whimpered in his chains, but they seemed a world away. What have I done? I abandoned him. No! A rustle of feathers deep in his mind, and he knew no more. Now it was a new day, and his mind was clear. He knew his name, the Wingfeather children's names, and where they were taking him. The road rose and fell over gradual hills and was well worn by fangs. The light in the east told him he was heading south to Fort Lammerdrawn. He screamed. The ridge runners laughed. As Pete screamed on the road to Lammerdrawn, morning birds chirped in the clearing where the Igbees slept. Cold blue light crept through the slit in the tent door. Janner stretched, forcing his eyes open and shaking the cobwebs from his mind. To his left, Poto snored so loudly that Jenner wondered how it hadn't woken him sooner. Oscar didn't snore, but with every long exhale of breath, his lips made a windy... <sighs> Jenner propped himself on one elbow and rubbed his eyes. In the faint light, he could see Tink asleep with his head on Poto's leg and Lily curled up beside Naya with her backpack cuddled to her chest, the way she used to hold Nugget. Jenner crept from the tent. The clearing was soft with dewy mist. Chunks of rubble rose out of the fog like gravestones, but the effect wasn't unpleasant. He'd been awake for many sunrises before, but never so close to the cliffs that he could watch the fiery ball lift itself from the sea. He walked through wet grass and sat with his feet dangling over the cliff. The dark sea of darkness wasn't dark at all at this hour. Feathery clouds at the edge of the world glowed orange and savage yellow. Birds wheeled in the bright air far below. Janner thought of his life only weeks ago, in the dregs of summer, when hay needed hauling, the hog pig needed feeding, the garden needed weeding, and life was boring. So much had happened to the, Jan to the Janner he used to be. His life had been in danger countless times. More tears had been shed in these last weeks than in his whole life before. Nugget was dead, the Glipwood Township ravaged. Before, he lived under the oppression of the fangs of Dang, but now he was on the run from them. Then he thought of his father, Esbend, and remembered the picture of him sailing on his twelfth birthday, an image Janner considered the essence of freedom. He thought about the royal blood in his veins and about the long-gone glory of his kingdom. He'd been too busy to think much about the real Anaria, 
It hovered in the distance of his best dreams, but remained a dream only. It was hard to believe it actually existed, that across these very waters a home awaited him. A real island where there had been real towns, where there stood a real castle, the castle where he was born. Janner ached to see it. He remembered the words of his father's verse, This is your land, and nothing can change that. He imagined lying in the warm wind of a heathery slope, eyes closed so he could feel the heartbeat of his land. He was only twelve, but he knew enough to realize that the way before him would be hard. Is it worth it? He asked himself. Was it worth losing his old life in order to learn the truth of who he was and who he was becoming? Yes. Like the pluck of a stringed instrument, the first edge of the sun broke loose and poured light over the world. The rest of the company was awake, grateful for the promise of a proper breakfast. Poto, who had assured the family that in daylight a small fire would be safe enough, sat on a rock rearranging the bacon that sizzled in the frying pan. With his other hand, Poto absentmindedly scratched at the stub below his knee where the rest of his leg had once been. Janner knew that at night his grandfather often unbuckled the harness that bound the wooden peg to his leg, but it was rare to see him in broad daylight without it. It was unsettling to see him now, vulnerable and... You're stared like you've never seen me stub before, lad, Poto said, squinting at Janner. I'm sorry, Janner said. It's just... Why won't you tell us how you lost it? Oh, I will, lad. One of these days. Poto took a deep breath. That's not a fun story for your Poto to tell. But I'm starting to think I should dig it up sooner rather than later. There's things you lot should know. What things? Tink asked quietly. Janner thought he saw Poto and Tink exchange an odd look. And the old pirate's eyebrows bunched together like a cloud at the front of his head. Can we just eat breakfast? Lily asked. Die, lass, that's a fine idea, Poto said, and Tink looked away. Oscar, how's your wound? Naya asked. Oscar blinked at the mention of his name. His gaze had been firmly placed on the sizzling bacon. It's fine, dear. Much better after a good night's sleep. He placed the arm of his spectacles in the corner of his mouth. You know, from the moment I first laid a top old nugget, I felt something happening. The wound warmed up somehow in a quite enjoyable way. This water from the first well, you don't suppose it gave Nugget some healing power, do you? Da had a dose of the stuff too, Odo said. Did the wound feel different when you were leaning on me? Oscar thought for a moment. No, I don't remember that it did. But we only gave you a drop, remember? Tink said. Uncle Pete gave Nugget too much. Hmm. Oscar frowned and tore the bloodied bandage away to reveal a bright red scar on his belly. It's gone, Lily said. A final gift from dear Nugget, young princess, Oscar said with wonder, and Lily beamed. So when do we leave? Tink asked after gulping down two strips of bacon. His lips and cheeks shone with grease. You said we had a day before the fangs started patrolling the north bank of the river. Shouldn't we get moving? Die, lad, we should. Poto winked as he cinched the strap of his peg to his thigh and thumbed the buckle rod, rod into a well-worn hole. Now you're thinking like a king. Tink gulped and looked away. Janner decided it was time to apologize. Tink, I'm uh, sorry I yelled at you yesterday. You didn't deserve that. Tink shrugged and poked at the fire with a stick. We wouldn't have made it without you, you know. Out of about 30 arrows, I only hit, what, three fangs? I'm a terrible shot. You are a terrible shot, Tink said with a smile. I don't know much, Janner said, but for what it's worth, I think, I think you're going to make a fine king. Tink's grin vanished. Thanks, I hope so, he said quietly. He left the fire and started taking down the tent. Janner looked at the others. He'd done his best to apologize and had even gone one step further with a compliment. What was that all about? He asked under his breath. Just let him be, Naya said. He'll be fine. The tent was rolled and tied to Poto's pack, and in minutes the company was ready to go. 
After all that had happened the day before, Janner felt ready for anything. His pack had lost its stiffness and hung from his shoulders in a way that fit him. He had wielded his sword in battle, and its weight no longer burdened him, but gave him courage. He recalled the heft of the bow in his hand, the tension and release when he drew it and loosed the arrows. The calluses on his palms felt good, and he imagined his hands one day being as rough and capable as Poto's. Say the word, King Calamar, Poto said with a slight bow of his head. Tink looked like a mouse in a trap. Then he loosed a belch that rivaled one of Poto's, and in a fit of laughter, the company set off into the forest. The Wing Feather Saga by Andrew Peterson Book Two North or Be Eaten Chapter 19 Ouster Will and the First Books All day, the company traveled through the wood, and except for the persistent worry that around every tree hit a toothy cow or horned hound, the trip was oddly enjoyable. Janna relaxed for the first time since they had left Pete's castle, as if a cold river inside him was finally in thaw. Still, the words the old gray dragon had spoken haunted him. He is near you. Beware. It occurred to him that the dragon hadn't actually said Nag the Nameless was nearby. But who else could it have meant? Who else would seek the young ones to use them for his own ends? The dragon probably meant the leader of the fangs at Miller's Bridge. Or it might have been talking about Zozab Coit. But why would a little ridge runner be of any concern to the sea dragons? Poto was probably right. The sea dragon was lying, manipulating Janner for the fun of it. But somehow that didn't seem right either. With every step they took toward Dugtown and away from the sea, Janner worried about the dragon less and enjoyed the beauty of the forest more. They saw no sign of toothy cows or horned hounds and only spotted one cave blat when it skittered behind a distant tree. Janner wondered why the animals on the north side of the river were so scarce. He thought about the old days in Scree before the war when Poto and Oscar said the dangerous creatures of the forest were kept in check by rangers and the people could travel where they pleased. The forest was a peaceful and lovely place when one wasn't running for one's life, and Janner began to understand anew what had been lost when the fangs invaded. Mr. Ratip, he said, is it true that Nag the Nameless only came to Scree because of us? Because he wanted the jewels of Anaria? Mm, yes and no, Oscar said after a moment. It's true he sent his armies here because he thought you would come this way, but he would have come anyway sooner or later. Don't blame yourself for what happened in Scree. Well, why would he have come if not for us? You remember your history, don't you, son? How many times did a wicked man come to power and suddenly find his kingdom too small? The Praxtons did it in the Third Epoch. The Shriveners did it when Timulus the Bent took the throne. And look what happened to the Furrows of Shreve. There's nothing left but the Woes, a terrible waste where there was once a garden the size of an ocean. Oscar stepped over a fallen branch. No, when a king forgets who he is, he looks for himself in the rubble of conquered cities. He's haunted by a bottomless pit in his soul, and he'll pour the blood of nations into it until the pit swallows the man himself. Jano shuddered. A deep, hungry darkness scared him because he felt it too, though he found he wasn't afraid of falling into it, not when he thought of his family. It was as if, between himself and that inner darkness, there were many arms reaching out to catch him. Arms like the branches of a tree, there to break his fall and give his hands and feet purchase. That's why Anaria was strong, lad, Oscar continued. The throne warden protects more than the high king's flesh. He protects his soul by reminding him at every turn what is good and noble and true in the world. The throne warden protects not just the king, but the kingdom as well. It is his job to remember and to remind. And sometimes, as you have seen, it is his job to sound the horn of battle and sling his blade for those he loves. You think Uncle Artham is all right? Oscar nodded. Aye! If he survived this long, it's either because of his wits or because Nag the Nameless wants him alive, as he does you. Perhaps it's a little of both. No, I'm certain Pete the Sockman will show himself again someday. He's no ordinary man, you know. 
He's definitely not ordinary, Janner said. That's not what I mean, Oscar said. It was said that Arthur P. Wingfeather shone with Eruman's fire. The wicked fled before him, and for all the years he and your father occupied Castle Ryson, peace and joy ran deep as a river. Footnote 1. Arumand was a throne warden in the year 54 of the Third Epoch, when the High Queen Nayani and his little sister was kidnapped by Simeon pirates. He passed through many trials to bring her home. He sailed past the edges of all maps in pursuit of the pirates, and years later returned with the queen at his side. His courage was rare, even among Anoreans, and it was said that his eyes were golden and shone in the dark like candles. Several books detailing his exploits are preserved in the Grand Library at the Castle Ryson. See The Aramind, translated by Herman Pretas, Simeon House Publishers, 345. I remember my mother saying that all the maidens in the kingdom had their eye on him, Janner said. That's what I've read. Did you know they wrote poetry about him? Really? It's true. Let's see. Oscar tapped his chin with one finger. They walked in silence for a few moments. Then Oscar cleared his throat and began, All children of the Shining Isle rejoice! A hero strides the field, the hill, the sand, with raven hair and shining blade in hand. The wicked quake when lifts the warden's voice. So flee his mount and fear his mighty band. So fair his word and fine his happy roar that breezes o'er the island from peak to shore. So tender burns his love for king and land. Who wrote that? Tink asked. I don't know, Oscar said. I found it in the Book of Anarian Poems. Very valuable. Her name was Alma Rainwater, Naya said. She was a good friend of mine. We always thought she would marry your uncle. We hoped she would, but she never made it out of the castle. Footnote 2. Though little known outside the Shining Isle, Alma Rainwater was one of many Anarian poets whose work was hailed as revolutionary because it rhymed and followed a strict form called Badum Badum Pentameter. I'm sorry, Highness, Oscar said. I know Anaria only through books. Walking with you through this wood is like a children's story come true. Naya smiled. You have no need to apologize, Oscar. Remembering Alma is good for my heart. Do you know any more of her poems? Oscar recited every strand of Anarian poetry he could remember. The company stopped for lunch, and since they had seen no animals bigger than a meat, Poto risked a fire. Say this, he said, indicating an oak with limbs that dipped almost to the ground. If the fire attracts anything too big for us to handle... We'll climb that tree until it's safe to come down, back down. Any problems with that plan or a teep? Oscar pushed his spectacles to the bridge of his nose and eyed the tree. Ah, well, let's see. I can't think of any forest creatures more dangerous than a toothy cow or a hound that are known to be good climbers. Of course, there could be snakes or snick buzzards. We are closer to the mountains now, though not much. And there are bugs, stinging bugs, like the... All right, then, that's the plan. Janner and Tink fetched firewood while Lily and Naya rummaged through the packs to find pots and pans and the spices needed to make the dried diggle meat taste more like a pot roast. Once the fire was crackling nicely, they sat around it with nervous eyes on the forest. Since the underbrush was sparse, it was possible to see trees an arrow shot or more away, which was good, Janner thought because it would be easy to see anything coming, but it also made him feel like he was being watched. For a long time, they sat and ate. Too long, Poto insisted, and the conversation led to the three gifts the children had received from Anaria. Lily and Tink showed Oscar the ancient whistle harp in the sketchbook. He fussed over the whistle harp, his eyes wide and boyish as he recalled to himself its significance in Anarian history. Oscar was speechless as he tilted the pages of their father's sketchbook into better light and gazed at them with his, through his spectacles. His eyes gleamed with emotion. Anaria! Oscar whispered as he looked at pictures of the Shining Isle drawn by the High King himself. It was the closest he had ever come to seeing that fair country with his own eyes. Finally, Janna removed the big leather-bound book from his back. Fascinating! Oscar breathed. 
He reached for the book like a child reaching for a dollop of candy. Grandpa says it's one of the first books, Janner said. Dai, said Poto. Da heard it was among the treasures of Anaria, but never laid me eyes on it until the night we fled the castle. What are the first books, anyway? Lily asked. There are many legends, young princess, Oscar said. One is that the maker himself wrote them and gave them to Duane. He was the first fellow, you know, as a gift for the care and governance of Ere We Are. The books taught Duane the ways of wisdom and guided him as he reigned throughout the first epoch, which was, they say, about 5,000 years ago. Another is that Duane and Gladys, she was Duane's wife, wrote the first books together and that they're a record of their time ruling the world. Another theory is that the first books were written by Will, their second son, who caused all manner of problems. Problems? Janner asked. He was called Ouster Will in the histories. Naya said, Here in Scree, we have the black carriage to scare children while they lie in bed awake. When I was a girl in the Green Hollows, it was stories of Ouster Will that made us shiver in our sheets. They said the ghost of Ouster Will made your house creak in the night. That Ouster Will was the spidery feeling on the back of your neck when you walked through the woods alone. Janner's skin crawled. Tink drew a hand across the back of his neck and shivered. Footnote 3. For a sample of a hollish poem about the dreaded Ouster Will, see Appendices, page 330. Douster will is as dead in the ground as me grandpappy Helmer, Poto said, snorting. You and your ghost stories. I'm not saying I believe them, Naya said. I'm saying Ouster Will was a bad man. Bad enough that there are still scary tales about him thousands of years after he died. Why do you look so nervous? Poto grunted. Mm, where was I? Oscar asked patting the big book in his lap the way a mother pats a baby. The first books, Janner said. Ah, other legends say Ouster Will wrote the first books. They say he learned many secrets of Ere We Are, secrets the maker gave to Duane, intended for the kings and the king alone. What kind of secrets? Lily asked. Well, over the thousand years that Duane ruled. A thousand years? Tink's eyes widened. Yes, maybe more. And during his long reign, he guarded the first well carefully. The well stood at the center of the city, and Duane administered its healing waters to the sick and wounded. And Duane himself, without meaning to, lived longer than anyone else. Oscar glanced at Poto. It's a long story that we don't have time to tell right now, but it's enough to say that Will overthrew his father, killed him, and stole the throne, intending to wield the power of the first well for his own ends. There are some who believe the first books were Ouster Will's record of the secrets he discovered. Janner looked at the book in Oscar's lap with wonder and dread. He wanted to believe the maker had written it, though that seemed impossible. Or that Duane, whom Janner has always pictured as a kind old man, wrote it. He shuddered at the thought that Ouster Will, some villain from the shadows of history, was the author of the book entrusted to him. Oscar jiggled with delight as he opened the book. Miss Writing, do you know what language it is? No, Naya said. Like Papa, I never saw the book until the day we fled. I gathered that Esmond had it, but I didn't know where he kept it hidden. He spent much of his time with Bonifer in those last days. Squoon, Oscar said, looking over the top of his spectacles at Naya. I know that name. Bonifer Squoon, Janner blurted. I remember that name, too. He closed his eyes. This is the journal of Bonifer Squoon, chief advisor to the High King of Anaria, keeper of the Isle of Light. Read this without my permission and I will pound your nose. Was he Esben's er, father's chief advisor? Naya and Poto exchanged a glance. Yes, she said. How did you? His journal was in the bottom of the crate from Dang, Tink said. The one we unpacked for Mr. Retip just before I found the map. I read it, Oscar said. In fact, I was reading it when I heard you and Pete fighting the fangs in front of the jail that night. I assumed it was a forgery of some kind of fiction from Anaria, a children's book, perhaps, fashioned to seem like the real thing for the purpose of feeding young imaginations. But you say the squoon was truly the advisor to the king? Die, 
and Scoon was the type to tell you that he'd pound your nose, that's for sure, Bodo said. Not that he would have ever actually pounded it. He was much too cowardly for that. Mm, so I was in possession of the chief advisor to the High King's journal, right there in books and crannies, but now gone forever, Oscar sighed. In the words of Vilmaret Opperholm in her essay on the decline of free cupcakes, how awful. I wonder how that journal ended up in Scree, Naya said to herself. Where did you say you found the crate from Dang, Oscar? In Torboro. Over the years, I've come across several crates of this kind, probably loot from ships the fangs pirated between here and Dang. It was a nice surprise, but not unheard of. The journal, of course, had I known it was authentic, would have made it a great deal more than a surprise to me. What was in it? Naya asked. Oscar thought for a moment. Nothing that interesting. No mention of first names that I remember. Only the king this and the queen that. He wrote of his trips to and from Dang. He seemed to do a lot of that, supervising shipments and trade routes and such. Odd work for a king's advisor, especially since he was an old fellow. But I thought a little of it since I believed the journal was a piece of fiction. I remember he spent a lot of time abroad, Naya said. So he was a busy old feller. What does this have to do with the book? Poto said with a trace of annoyance. Janner could tell he was itching to move on. Bonifer and Esben spent much time together in those last days, Naya explained. I heard them talking about the first book more than once. That's all I know about it. Mm, the letters look like Old Holosh, the ancient language of the Green Hollows. Do you remember that from your youth, Highness? Oscar asked Naya. I studied Old Holish when I was a girl, but no one speaks it anymore. She narrowed her eyes and tilted her head from one side to the other. Try this, she said, flipping the book around. There. It's been a while since I've tried to read it, but that's definitely Old Holish. Ah, Oscar said. I see it now, too. He studied the cover and binding of the book. This isn't the original cover. Whoever replaced it, however many years ago, didn't know the language either and placed the new cover backward. What we thought was the first page is actually the last. See? It all looked the same to Janner, but it was fascinating nonetheless. I think, Highness, with what I know of languages and what you remember of Hollish, we might be able to translate this. Oscar looked at Naya eagerly. I don't know, she said. There's a reason these books were hidden, a reason they haven't been translated before. But, Highness, there must have been a reason the book has been preserved all these years. And a reason Father wanted me to have it, Janner said quietly. We really need to get a move on, Poto said, kicking dirt over the fire. I know you'd like to sit all day and have a nice discussion about old upside-out languages, but we've got a long way to go. The crunch and snap of breaking branches echoed through the forest. Janner and Tink leapt to their feet, drew their swords, and took their places on either side of Poto, forming a fierce wall of protection in front of Naya, Lili, and Oscar. A toothy cow, bigger than any Janner had ever seen, lumbered toward them. The tree! Poto yelled. No! Seconds later, they were safe on the swooping limbs of the glipwood oak, looking down at the giant beast as it limped around the trunk of the tree. Blood dripped from its teeth. The cow's milky eyes rolled, wild and unable to focus. Look! Lily pointed at a spear that hung from its right shoulder. The cow gurgled, its eyes fluttered, and with an ignoble shudder it crumpled to the ground and died. After a moment of silence, the company climbed down the tree. I'm glad she was injured, Bodo said as he wrenched the spear from the cow's side. Or we might not have had time to get clear. Tink squatted near the cow's head and poked at it with a stick. So there are fangs nearby, Janner said, eyeing the bloody spear. No, lad, Poto said. This ain't no fang spear. Far too fine a weapon for that. This explains why we've not seen any critters before now. He threw the spear aside and wiped his hands on his breeches. Stranders! Now will you tell us what a strander is? Tink asked. Die, Poto said darkly. Thieves and killers, if they're around, we need to move and fast. The sooner we get clear of the forest, the better. <laughs>